And there you go. Please welcome Mr. Tom Arnold. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You got a mic. You. Yeah, you got a mic. To you, man. Yeah, welcome. Live the dream. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you guys for coming out here. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, we've been, uh, I'm a, a single 62-year-old dad with an 8-year-old to 5-year-old. So number one, I have to work forever. But number two, we've been, uh, had COVID. We did homeschool the last year and a half. So I haven't been around many adults. So it's good to see you guys. It's good, it's good to <laughs> chat with you guys. Oh, yes. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So this is the second one of these I've done ever. Wow. And uh, I like it. I like it. There's a lot of freaks here. Yes, it makes me happy. That. <laughs> it's good. So I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And this time's yours. You want to talk a bit, take questions, whatever you're comfortable yeah, with. Yeah. Um, I was here uh, by, by my old sports show we came to Pittsburgh. Do you call this Pittsburgh where we are right now? Yeah. yeah well, anyway. Oh. I, I, I hit, think hit, hit the button on the side yeah, there. Shut you your, you, you shut yeah. it off. I got these hearing aids so I could hear my kids better, but they keep putting their fucking Bluetooth uh, iPads through them, <laughs> and TikTok videos will all of a sudden be hearing them, and, and then the photo rings. So I very seldom, yeah. <laughs> it's like my dad. He got I got him uh, hearing aids because I was like, I, you know, I, I, it's impossible to talk to you, and then he just stopped using them because he really didn't want to hear. He really didn't want to hear, and. Uh, but I'm trying these things out, but they're so complicated. The kids are so smart with their, uh, you know, their iPads and their, and by the way, a lot of parents don't let their kids use iPads. How the fuck do they do that, man? You gotta, those, if you're going somewhere, you put them on the iPad and they got their stuff and uh, how do you, what was life like before the iPad? You could have everything on there, you guys know it. Anyway, enough about me, it's, it's, uh, it's great to be here and uh, around all you folks see some of your faces and uh, yeah there's a lot of characters here I'm gonna bring my kids to the next one to see I wish I would have saved all the memorabilia I had so I could have sold it <laughs> 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 I'm shot shitty what a what a great thing what's that what is your name my future fifth ex-wife right here <laughs> in the front I could just tell <laughs> shit's happening I could just tell you know, anyway, well, thank you. Do you have any, do we do, what do we do questions? The most interesting man in the world over here. How do we, what do we do, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> What's happening? Let me ask you, your hair. The tattoo. Oh, my God, that's amazing. Oh, it's Van Gogh's Starry Night. Yeah, that is really, really cool. I told you to see freaks here. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had a tattoo of my, uh, one of my wives. I'm not going to say which one. Uh, um here and I got it I'll tell you this back in 1994 uh, my marriage was, uh, it was it was not going well so I thought I'm gonna throw it was it was Valentine's Day was this on the clip it was Valentine's yeah, Day yeah and I thought I'm gonna throw a Hail Mary on this thing and I'm gonna do some a romantic gesture so awesome that she will not be able to walk away from it and uh, and I went and spent seven hours at the tattoo artist from my nipple to my collarbone getting her face, and by the way, nipple and collarbone are yeah. the two most yeah. painful places. Well, maybe the, like the butthole would hurt worse, but, <laughs> <laughs> but nipple and collarbone are sensitive. And I got a, this tattoo, and in my mind, she'd come home, and, and she'd, I'd go, honey, I just wanted to tell you, happy Valentine's Day. And I'd show it to her, and she'd go, oh my God, I just remembered how much I loved you. But in reality, it went like this, honey, happy Valentine's Day. And she kept walking. She goes, oh, my God, you're an asshole. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm an asshole. But now I'm the worst kind of asshole. I'm an asshole with a fucking tattoo of my ex-wife on it. Part of my leg is that there's kids here. So I started getting that thing removed immediately. And, uh, uh, and she had a tattoo on her butt that said property of Tom Arnold, which made me the fourth largest property owner in California for a while, for a while. <laughs> she did have that tattoo. And, uh, but the, the tattoos had... That's useful. I've had three hair transplants. Why didn't I just tattoo my... And by the way, young people, don't ever cut your hair. Young, I, if I didn't have to cut my kid's hair once in a while, I wouldn't because 
it's it, you know enjoy it while you can. I used to have beautiful freaking hair when I was in high school. Anyway, well, thank you guys. <laughs> you know, but but then uh, and then a lot of people are here because uh, it says I'm <laughs> thinking uh, for Roseanne and True Lies and I w I worked on the Roseanne show for six years. It was amazing. I I got to write and produce and act with some of the best people that have ever been on television, and. Uh, and then one day, uh, my, my ex-wife filed for divorce. And coincidentally, I lost my job on the Roseanne show that day. It was, you know, they say they're painful things. But uh, I'd done this movie called True Lies. I'd been filmed that whole year. And, uh, and, and I, I was like, because people were like, yeah, he'll never work again. He wrote his wife's coattails. He'll be back in Iowa in two weeks. And I was like, that is probably true. But... I said, I'm going to have great stories for these six years on one of the best shows ever on television. But uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jim Cameron were like, F those people. You know, when True Lies comes out, that's going to change everything. I was like, yeah, I'd like to believe that, but I don't believe that. But I really got lucky because I, I filmed that movie, and it did come out, and, and uh, it did change uh, uh, things. And uh, But the movie True Lies, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's lines where I was going through this divorce, and I'd come to work. And, and, and Rosanna moved out of the house, and, but she was having someone come in my house just to fuck with me. Like, I'd come home from work, and I, all the batteries were out of all the remote controls. Like, that's psycho. <laughs> and that's what women, I'm saying women are smarter. Like, I'm a, 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 a macro uh, kind of a, you know, I'll, I'll burn the house down. But I'm not going to just have people just come in, and, and, and I'd be trying to use the remotes. And I knew there wasn't batteries in it, but I'm trying to freaking use them, make it work. And this, and Arnold and I, by the way, before we started the movie, uh, uh, Jim Cameron called me and said, would you like to, Arnold to come over to your house and train with you? And I was like, yeah, I believe I would like the greatest bodybuilder that ever lived to come home to my house and work out with me in my unused home gym. And so the first day we were filming, uh, he came at, at six in the morning, I answered the door and I'm like, oh shit, I forgot you were coming. Everyone I've ever met is here. Guys, look at this. Arnold Schwarzenegger is here to train with me. And, uh, and we did that. And then that night, Jim Cameron says, what time do you want Arnold to be there tomorrow? And I go, oh, I don't. He's like, well, why? I go, one, I can say that I worked out with Arnold Schwarzenegger. But number two, it is a lot of pressure to work out with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Because he's very, you know, he knows what he's doing. And he does this thing where he compliments one part of your body. He's like, Tom, you have a fantastic right shin and then he starts in on my trouble spots i got a lot of damn trouble spots i don't need to hear from him and uh but but <laughs> but i came out arnold and i started these shakes which a lot of eyes bled them up and, and i have one before i went to work I, I make a couple and so i had like 30 ice cube trays at, at the freezer and then one morning i got ready to come to work i opened the freezer and there's no ice cube trays in there and so i went into work and we're getting ready to shoot and i said to, to jim cameron arnold what kind of a sick bitch takes the ice cube trays out of the freezer? And Jim Carrey was like, say that in this next scene. And so it's in the movie. But, but it's a good question. Like, what? Who thinks of that? Anyway, but I'm uh, very grateful. And uh, I've, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of, you know, I worked at the kill floor of a meatpacking plant for three years when I got out of high school to save money for college. And literally... Every dream I ever had has come true, you know. And so I always think about, and by the way, if you work on the kill floor of a meatpacking plant, you gotta make your own fun, you're, you know. And I remember I was chiseling heads and, and imagining, you know, you have dreams like, I imagine that Robin Williams and I were best friends. He was on board committee then. And so years later when I did a movie called Nine Months, where, where Robin is our, plays our doctor and Hugh Grant and I and Julianne Moore and, and Jody Cusack, the, the, we filmed in San Francisco where Robin lived and so the first night he had everybody over to his house you know and, and uh, I finally I get a minute with him I'm, I'm like uh, hey I've been here before and he's like what do you mean I go yeah when I worked at the beat packet plant I dreamed that, that we were best friends and he's like we're not best friends I go I know but this is very similar <laughs> and uh, but Robin was a, was a good friend and I'll tell you everything good you ever heard about Rob Williams is true and more. And if I called him at three in the morning and said, hey, so-and-so's in trouble, he'd be like, whether he knew him or not, he'd be like, let's go get him. So that's who, that's who he was. So.
Do you have any uh, questions? Am I over my time? No, absolutely. No. No. <laughs> Anybody has no, questions, this, just you, raise your hand, and I'm going to come to you. And uh, look at you, we'll, we'll Dos Equis. <laughs> when I do drink, it's Dos Equis. Just squeeze in here. <laughs> he does, right? Yeah. Now, who are you uh, to be? What character are you? Oh, that's cool. Okay, I've never seen Harry Potter, but the guy that directed Harry Potter, the first one directed, died months with Robert Williams, Chris Columbus. No, my kids watch Harry Potter. Yeah, it's, I guess it's very good. <laughs> I've heard good things about <laughs> I've it. I've heard good things about it. All right, question here. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Uh, first of all, thanks for autographing the entire ice cube tray on my uh, poster that you signed. The whole oh, quote. Oh, that yeah, I did. I got most of the quote down there. That was awesome. Which I'm happy to do. Yeah. But also, um, Best Damn Sports Show, period. Yeah. I used to love that show. And my favorite remem you know, memory from that was when Arnold was on, and he says, here's a true lie. I loved working <laughs> with Tom Arnold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's... Arnold is so funny. Do you have any funny, funny stories so from funny. Best Damn Sports Show? Oh, my God, I have so many. Arnold was on there? I have so many great stories. You know, uh, Shaq was... The whole time Shaq played for the Lakers, he was my next-door neighbor. Shaq, security. how cool is that? And, and it was a time when I was really, uh, uh, my, my ex-wife and I were struggling. We wanted to have a child, and, and we were doing in vitro, which I was against because it was my problem, the low sperm count. But I said, and I don't want you to have to make your body go through the hormone stuff of, of in vitro. And by the way, if you are with someone uh, that is doing in vitro and they're getting hormone shots, uh, there are side effects. And when you notice them, do not freaking mention them because you will get stabbed. But uh, I, in Iowa, I kept thinking, no, let's adopt, let's get a sperm donor. And then Shaquille O'Neal is my next door neighbor. So I'm like, in Iowa, well, I grew up in the Tumble, Iowa farming community. And if you wanted to borrow a cup of sugar for your next door neighbor, you went over there and knocked on their door and said, hey, may I borrow a cup of sugar? And they're like, hell yeah, you can. And I, 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 I was always like, I got to get the courage to go because they give you those little cups with the sperm, you know, when you get up. I got to go get a fucking cup of shack, man, because that if I had a seven foot tall black son, I'd be, be the happiest guy here. But Arnold, <laughs> I've had so many weird and funny things with Arnold. In fact, he was he's the best human, you know, like his his. Uh, and I learned a lot about being of service to other people from him and and. Uh, he was the first person at the hospital when my, my son was born, and he got right in the delivery room. I don't know how you get into the delivery room. Just walk right, unless you, I suppose it's because he's Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he picked up my son, and you know, he had fuzz on his head, and, and, and us men, we like to smell the heads. He's like, you know, I have four of these. Well, five. Anyway, so, but he is the funniest. He is such a, a sweet and funny guy, and, and uh, I'm so grateful that our friendship is, you know, because it's sometimes it's tough to be friends, you know, that long with me. Anyway, it seems like, but um, but I love him and respect him. And Jamie Lee Curtis, the same thing, you know. We played uh, poker for charity a couple weeks ago, and it's one of those rare times where everybody stays buddies. But I have a a million. Um, <laughs> just thinking of all the. It, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger stuff that I can't say here. But, uh, but no, he's a really great human being. And he's like, every year we give out 10,000 gifts to kids in South Central L.A. It's called the Miracle on First Street. And, and then, uh, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the best story. But, you know, it's a great thing we do. And then he'll go, uh, at the end of it, it's exhausting too. You know, these kids light up around the block. This is the only gift they're getting from Santa Claus, you know. Believe it or not, and the cops wrap all the gifts for it with us, and, and it is a big deal. But then Arnold at the end, and it's exhausting, because uh, <laughs> kids, even kids that get one gift, are like, you know, Arnold will hand him something. They're like, Yeah, I don't want this. I want that pair of shoes over there. I want those specific shoes, or I want a bike. And Arnold grew up poor too. He's like, You take it to basketball. Learn to play basketball. But, but he's such a great. And then uh, at the end of that, you, you know, that takes us. 10 hours said that, that last year, the year before last, because we couldn't do it last year because of COVID, but we made sure the kids got the gifts. He'll be off to somewhere else, like going to visit firefighters somewhere, or, and he, and, he, and he seems like he's running for office all the time. You know how guys, they run for office, will act like, yeah, I really care about everything, but that's really how he is, and, uh, and he's uh, certainly an, an inspiration.
Got a question right over here. Yes. I just wanted to say I really loved you on the Jackie Thomas show. You're oh, yeah, yeah. really great. And True Lies, of course. And you already mentioned the ice cube bit. Can you just say, if possible, I remember the first time I got shot out of a cannon. That was a great one. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, that seat, well, number, number one, my son for the Jackie Thomas show is going to be here tomorrow, Breckett Meyer, who's a very good... I can't believe he has kids of his own, but you know, people grow up. When somebody plays your kid a movie or TV show, they're always a kid to you, you know? And then he's done, and then he and I have done a couple other movies together, but uh, 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 I'm spacing on the young ladies who played Arnold's daughter. She was so funny. And uh, uh, Elijah Deshku. And she's such a great adult. But when she was like 12, and she's so mouthy. I mean, she, we had a good thing because our, my character and her had a thing, you know, like back and forth. But, uh, but she, um, you know, that was an ad lib. I remember the first time I got shot out of Canada. The next take I did something else. The next take I did something else. And, the, and, uh, and I'm lucky that the director uh, put up with that because he, you know, he's a serious guy. Um, but I remember we were filming on uh, Constitution uh, Avenue in Washington, D.C. And it's when we're in the car... Arnold Knight, and, uh, and uh, he's reading the report I've spied on his wife, and, and uh, I'm kind of going through it, and he, he says, I don't read one of the pages intentionally, and, uh, and uh, he's like, give me the goddamn page, and he pulls the car over, which he did, and comes around the car, and, uh, and, I, you know, and then he smashes the window out, and every time I would say something different, and uh, Cameron's like, dude, just goddamn it, do one by the way I wrote it. And then I did, and then everybody. And he's like, now do 17 more. I want a different one every time. So they had to re put that uh, window back in. And Arnold was killing it. It was late at night because they had to film late at night there. And it was killing Arnold. But he's like, okay, so I want 17 different takes right now. But it was a good, it was a good uh, lesson. But we had a lot of. of uh, of fun and I think that the, if you see Arnold and I's characters in that movie, that's not unsimilar to our, how it, I didn't feel I was acting at all because I already that's how we do the back and forth. And uh, by the way, Bill Paxton, uh, I know, I'm sure you guys are friends of Bill Paxton. There's nobody loves making movies more than Bill Paxton. And uh, I'll tell you this story. Arnold hates this story. We are also filming during the day on Constitution Avenue around the the. The uh, Capitol, and uh, uh, and uh, it, I was in the front with with Arnold, and Bill Paxton was sitting in the back. I can't remember the scene, and I I love to make Bill Paxton laugh, and the way the way to make him laugh was to make fun of Arnold Schwarzenegger because nobody else. But he and Jim Cameron were friends from when they first started the business, when they would distress furniture on a, a, a I don't know if it was Russ Meyer, but they started from day one, so they're the oldest friends. So he could he could be funny about Jim Cameron. And I love that. But anyway, we pull over, and we're ready to pull out into the shot, and this light goes out here that's on the sidewalk facing our car. And Arnold's like, the light's going to take 20 minutes. I'm going to give you guys a tour of the monuments. And, and Arnold, you know, you can love this country, and then you can freaking Arnold Schwarzenegger love this country. This guy is, you know, he came here in 1968 with a... I imagine a pair of short shorts and a sneaky tank top and like a quarter. <laughs> and he's, you know, he's a billionaire. Like he's done everything. This country, he's so excited about it. Anyway, so I love the body mind. So, you know, anytime you land in Washington, D.C., you come in, it, it kind of takes your breath away. You're like, oh, I know that place or that place, that thing. But Arnold takes us on a tour of the monuments, which I, and he's like, guys, that's a Lincoln Memorial. Oh my God, this, that. And then there's a Washington Monument. Did you guys know that? Anyway, so we come back around the street, and in the middle of the street is Jim Cameron. Jim Cameron's like a six foot three, Robo Canadian guy. He's not like a, you think a regular director. And he's standing out there in the street, and you can tell how pissed he is. It turned out it took two minutes to change that light, and not 20. And holding traffic in Washington, D.C. is a big frickin' deal. There's like 500 people watching. And so he comes up, and Arnold pulls the car up, and he comes around to my door, and he crawls, and he starts to crawl over me, because I know he's mad at Arnold, so I'm like, yeah, I'm safe. And he starts to crawl over me, and I slink out of my car door. Like, I'm like, get the fuck out of here, I'll tell you that. And he gets right on top of Arnold's like, if you ever pull that shit again, I'm gonna have, you have to get a new director. And then, uh, you know, ever and just lay and there's people watching. They just lay it into him, and uh, and then I get back to the car. I'm like, 
hey man, you gonna take that shit from that asshole? Or are you <laughs> fucking, he's the director. And Arnold says something that sticks with me now. He said, I have to, I fucked up. And that's a righteous thing to do, you know? Because he was never late for it. He was always like, Tom, you can't be late all the time. What if they blow up the bridge and then you can't? I go, oh, whatever. And this is one time, the whole, the whole time known him where he was, he actually did something wrong. That's what it was so funny to me. But it was also a lesson like, hey, if you screw up, man, this isn't about egos. You screw up, you're gonna, this is what's gonna happen. And I, I love him. He hates that story because he's like, you make me look like a pussy. What do you tell that story? I go, no, you're, that's a real man move to own that you did something wrong. And also it was hilarious. But uh, so. All right, we got a question for you right here. Mm -hmm. Hello, Mr. Arnold. Hello. I have two, um, a two-part question. Yeah. What was it like working on Soul Plane, I love oh. that movie, and also working with the Trailer Park Boys? One, Soul Plane. That movie, we had so much fun. You know, they had a fake uh, Set 47. Uh, uh, there was no fake pot. Same with Trailer Park Boys, let me tell you. You know how they smoke fake pot in movies? Trailer Park Boys, that's a real deal. Maybe it's because I was with Snoop Dogg in both m movies. But we had so much fun. That was, uh, uh, there's so many great people in there. That was Kevin Hart's first starring role. He's, I saw Monique beat him up. I'm not kidding. Like he was making fun of her. She had hairy legs, whatever. And she's like, hey, but if you say it again, she chased him down and got on top of it. It's hilarious. But uh, we, had, uh, we had a lot of fun. It was, uh, uh, what's her name? She's, she was on Modern Family. She's wonderful. Um, she's from Columbia. Uh, yeah, Sophia Vicar. I love her so much. And it was her first movie. There's a lot of really great people in there. The movie did not do well because someone stole the master. <laughs> there was 300,000 copies already on the streets before the movie came out. It was the biggest. The person, they went to prison. It was the biggest theft of... Uh, uh, and what's funny is on my sports show... People would come on to promote Soul Plane, you know, and Snoop Dogg came on, and, and uh, I went back to the dressing room, I'm talking to him, and I go, what are those? You got, did they already send you DVDs to the movie? He goes, no, I got these out of Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. They're, they're, they're $5 each. I go, that's fucking, that's our pirated movie. He goes, I know, they're $5 each. And so I went down, and right after work, I drove, went down to Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles and bought myself some too. I'm like, well, at least we'll get them. Because sometimes they'll say they'll send you movies, and it takes a long time. Well, these were, and then when I went to Afghanistan that same year, they had the movie. Like, you know, because the, the, the servicemen and women really have access to pirated DVDs, I'll tell you that right now. And so I'd be like, where'd you get these? Oh, I bought them at that, we went to this Russian thing, and, and I go, but you know, that's the way it should be. But um, Trailer Park Boys, I, I'm a super fan. I've seen every episode, and uh, I kind of feel like I discovered that show with, within my group of friends. And, and uh, I, I called up Jimmy Kimmel. I said, you got to see this show. This is the best show. These guys are out of Canada. And then he had them fly down and be on his show, which was their first time on, in America. And in America on television, you know. And uh, so we all went out to dinner together. And then I had to go home and, and uh, to do something. I think maybe I had a kid or something. And, uh, or a wife, maybe, I don't know, but not at the same time, of course. But uh, I went home and I called Jimmy the next day. I go, well, how did the night end up? And he goes, what do you mean, how did it end up? They're in my hot tub right now. They'd stayed, they're the real deal. And so it was a great honor to do that show. And people that know uh, the Trailer Park Boys, you know, they're, they know funny. Because when people go, oh, I, I like you from whatever, but when they say Trailer Park Boys, I, I go, I know they know the real shit, man. Because that show is brilliant, and uh, it's nice. Okay. Got another question right here. Okay. All right. Hello, Tomo. Hello. Arnold, great to have you with us. Thanks. For, yes, it's, it's good to be here. All right, so this is a two-part question. Oh, my God. What were your favorite memories on True Lies, and how would you describe your experience on the episode of running wild with Barry Grylls, especially the scene where you help him catch a fish. That's one of my favorite episodes of season one. Okay, I've got a lot of great memories of True Lies. I've, been, I've covered a few, uh, just a million. So I'm gonna talk about Bear Grylls. Like some of these shows you see on TV, these reality shows are bullshit. But the Bear Grylls show, you know who he is? He's an action adventure. Like he's a former uh, a special forces guy out of the UK. 
uh, which is o- almost like being a, a, a real Special Forces guy. Uh, and, uh, and, and so before that show, you know, you sign these documents and stuff. And, and uh, uh, the, well, one thing I'm going to recommend, if you ever go on a show like that, um, do not tell the producer your biggest fear. Because that's what you're going to be fucking doing, I'll tell you right now. You're going to be doing. And so I told the producer, they go, what are you afraid of? I knew we were going to be, there's a helicopter, we're going to be doing stuff. I said, well, my biggest fear, and I knew we were filming in the Gold Coast of Oregon. It's beautiful up there, but there's a lot of high cliffs. I said, my biggest fear is like having to walk across a ravine, you know, like on a, a log that I don't trust, and, it, and then falling to my death like that. And so... That's what we did end up doing, you know. And, uh, and Bear Girls is the real deal. Like, and he had a, a very small crew. Um, and, and when I did walk across that thing, I felt really good. I made it. And, and I thought, well, that's such a big thing because I was afraid of that. You know, Bear Girls also, we were on the side of a, it's not a mountain, but it's a straight drop off. Like, and he was just, between takes, he was talking to me. And he's walking back and forth here. And I go, hey, fuck. Get, the, get over here. You're making me so nervous. Like, But, uh, you know, we, we got to camp out. Uh, we slept in a tent to, to, together. Well, first of all, the hand fishing, which I'm from Iowa, so you do some of that. And, and that was a real deal. And then they tried to, to gross me out by having me eat, I don't know, worms or whatever. But I was hungry. I was happy to eat. For real, you cannot gross me out on eating stuff. But we really did that. We, we hiked... Uh, uh, for 10 miles in the in the forest there, which is a long friggin' hike, and there are so many great things about it, but that night, I had to build my tent or whatever, and then we went, we did go to a nice tent, but it was me and Bear Grylls and his main guy, his main special forces guy, who, who, who by the way, walked backwards as I was walking across that log. I'm thinking, oh, this is so bad, I made it across. He filmed me walking backwards, this guy. So that's that's crazy. Like I thought I was, but we had steaks. They got brought out real food, and it was just nice to spend time with, with Bear Grylls and, and his old longtime good friend. And th- those are the moments you kind of look for. Like what is special about this? But I also felt like, man, that was a lot of. And I da- I talked Zach uh, uh, Efron into doing the show, and, and I said, hey, what great, you should do it, you know. And uh, he's like, I'll do it if I can jump out of a airplane. I was like, oh, I'm sure they'll let you jump out of an airplane. And, uh, but he wanted to jump out by himself. And, you know, I've, du- I've jumped out of airplanes for shows. And, and they want you to be on a, uh, have a guy with you. What do you call it? The, where they're, yeah. But he wanted to do it himself. And so they let him at first. And they had trouble with his uh, parachute. They didn't show this on NBC. But he about, it was a, they were like, oh, my God. He's not. And, and Bear Girls had to jump out and get him. Like they were up high enough that he could jump out and save his life, which I thought would make the best show, but they're so afraid no celebrities would do the show anymore. <laughs> they, you know, Zach Everett's like, yeah, that was awesome, everything's good, you know. And then he does a, he does a show where he travels around the world now too, right? Is that Zach Everett? I don't know. There's a lot of shows. <laughs> you, gra- any grab other s- questions? Yeah, let's grab some more. Right down here. I knew if we waited long enough, someone yeah, would raise their Yeah, that's sad. Wait them out. You're doing mercy questions. Like fishing. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hi. So, um, one of my favorite childhood films was The Stupids. Yeah. Um, do you have any good experiences on that? Like, any good memories of that production? Well, my kids just watched The Stupids about a week and a half ago for the first time, you know. And uh, it, I enjoyed I hadn't seen it for many, many, many years. And I enjoyed it. And there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of great people in it. There's a lot of nuggets of hidden stuff. There's there's five or six very famous directors that, that do little piece parts in that, so they could keep their from Robert Wise who directed Sound of Music, to uh, you know Adam Atoyan, Norman Jewison, just a lot of and John Landis who directed puts them in so they keep their SAG health insurance. You know if you work a certain amount. But uh, I had a very good time with. Uh, uh, me, what was it? Jessica Lundy, who played Mrs. Stupid, she was very, you know, we had a good time. That's all I'm going to say. But uh, <laughs> no, we did. With me and her, and the kids went down to Niagara Falls. We were filming in Toronto, 
and uh, and had the best. The first time I'd ever been to Niagara Falls, we took a train down there, which is crazy now that I think about it, that all the actors would get on a train and go down there. But I'll tell you this story about Jessica. So in Toronto, there is a gentleman's club, and we, we were always trying to think, how do we make John uh, Landis, how do we freak him out? And you know, our, our, our outfits, our costumes were, were extensive, and John Landis's wife had decided she's a great costume designer. But Jessica's dress, she wore the same Mrs. Stupid dress. And so uh, after work, uh, uh, we all went down to this place called the Brass Rail, just, you know. And Jessica came out on stage. John Lattice is sitting there in the front row with her Mrs. Stupid's <laughs> outfit on. And, and she's, she's very physically gifted. And spun around the, the pole. And John Lattice like, stop it. Stop it. You'll ruin the costume. Like, he didn't care about anything else because we were like what if people write that we're here as the stupids at this place he's like don't t ruin the costume but uh but there was a lot of we had a lot of great fun it's fun to see stuff through your kids eyes you know that you've done because you don't always you know my son has a poster of arnold schwarzenegger in his bedroom one of those posing things and, and uh you know but to see your your work you know uh, uh and see it through your kids eyes and they liked stuff that I would went, oh, that's dumb, like Camp Fred 3 and stuff. But him, my, well, the funniest part is my daughter would watch it at my ex-wife's house <laughs> and watch it over and over and over again. I got a big kick out of that. But, um, but it's fun to see stuff with your kids. And The Stupids, it came, when it came out, it didn't, I think it, it was based on children's books, but I think people thought it would be dumb and dumber. In fact, the studio that bought it was New Line. They thought it would. Then they saw it. It's not dumb and dumber. It's different, and uh, but the people that love the stupids, love the stupids, and uh, I'm just very grateful that I got to, to be in it. Got a uh, way back, in the back. Way in the back here to your right, we got a question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, huge fan, and um, was wondering what was your favorite uh, episode that you starred in it on the show Roseanne, and also is uh, John Goodman is funny. Offset is he on, is on set. Well, I think my favorite episode was the most nerve-wracking, which was the first time I was on the show. It was 1989, and uh, uh, Rosanna and I become a couple, you know, and uh, so that was out in the in the tabloids and the you know out there. And so I was in the writers' room, and the the, the other executive producer said, "You know what we should do? We should have you on the show because then people will watch it, you know." And uh, this is in year two of the show, and, and uh, I said, okay. And then they wrote a thing where I, I this character, Arnie, that I played, uh, made, you know, everything's a takeoff of, of Tom Arnold, Jackie Thomas, Arnie, the Tom show, whatever, and Arnie Thomas. And I kissed her on the show. It was a, you had to do that right that delicately, you know. And, uh, but I remember how nervous I was because originally, you know, I started out as a stand-up comedian, and, uh, and that I met Roseanne when I was 23, and she just started out from Denver and came to Minneapolis to perform where I was, and man, we became fast friends. We hit it off and had, a, had too good of a time together. And, uh, and then I started writing jokes for her, which I'd see on Johnny Carson, which is like, whoa, I can't, my frickin' friend is on Johnny Carson. I said frickin', I to try not to say the F word. Um, is on Johnny Carson, and she's doing a couple of the jokes I wrote. And so I was like, I want to be a stand-up comedian, and then I thought, and then she's like, I want you to come out and write the show. And I was like, okay, great. I will be a writer. That's amazing. And, and I hadn't even thought about acting on the show, but it was so stressful because there was a, a group of people that did not want me to succeed, or Roseanne, quite frankly. And, uh, um, she, and, and I was nervous, and I was nervous in the rehearsal. And then we filmed on Friday, but on Thursday, it was a rehearsal for the, the network. And it had to go well, or they, they were considering replacing me, which would have, I would have never acted again. Like how, that would have been embarrassing for Roseanne, for me, whatever. And she told me that night we were home, and she said, I want you, I'm gonna give you one tip about acting. You, you walked in every room, balls first. That, you own that room. That is, your room, and it was very helpful. You know, when you walk in, you, this is, you're, you don't come in faint of heart, this is your room, you're gonna do this. And it went great, and uh, uh, you know, uh, I had a lot of good times. John Goodman 
is so freaking funny, you know. Uh, and back in the day, this was back in the day when people were drinking. And uh, <laughs> he, you know, he'd do these characters between uh, scenes, between takes, especially with the live audience. The live audience was crazy good. Um, you know, a guy that was a, a carny and uh, it, it, it had a, a, a physical, uh, he had a, I'm not going to say what, but he'd play that character. And, uh, and then he'd, he had a sh he'd write sh songs, he'd sing it. And they, actually, they used this on one of the tags, the credit tags, which I loved on the show, but called Going to a Free Show. And it was really about, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I remember, and he'd sing it to the audience who came to a free show. Go to it, it don't cost no money it's because it ain't too goddamn funny we're going to and I just thought how funny of a human he was and this is again when people back in the day I think people had a couple beers and, but he's a brilliant actor Roseanne asked me to play his part originally and I was like I don't even know what that means but I went in and met but I was like and then they go well we're thinking about John Goodman I go oh John Goodman's great John Goodman is good. I'll just, I'll be a writer. Like, that's, you know, and he, he really, he had Lori Metcalf. Lori Metcalf is, who played Jackie, is probably the best actor, one of the best actors in, in the world. Like, and, and what helped Roseanne is because she'd never acted before, having these great actors, Estelle, uh, 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 Estelle Parsons was her mom. She's a brilliant actor. These guys are from... Uh, Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. These guys have, you know, and and uh, you know Ned Beatty was uh, John's dad, and and John Randolph was was Roseanne's dad, and and the quality of acting, you know, was so high of, of people that had been staged on the, uh, you know, started on the stage that it helped Roseanne be able to just be herself, and and you know kind of learn what what was going on there, and Laurie Metcalf, <laughs> and the the during the pilot, which is shot in 1988, we shot a pilot, and then there was a writer's strike. So, you know, wh what are you going to do, party? And so I remember when I, one night we went out, and it was John and Roseanne. This is before we, Roseanne and I were a couple. We were just best buddies. And then uh, Lori and I were in the back seat of the car. And, uh, um, uh, you know, her and John seemed like they were getting along very well, you know, everybody's. And then. Uh, Lori, uh, I, I was holding her hand back there, you know, and, and the next morning, Roseanne calls me in and says, hey, man, uh, listen, I got to tell you something. Uh, you and Lori, yeah, that's not going to work because uh, writers can't date actors. That's a rule of show business. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I did not know all the rules of show business. I, I, that will not happen again. And it, was, it, it would turn out, because, it's not a rule of show business, but it, it is because Roseanne liked me. Like I didn't know, <laughs> it took me a long time. Uh, uh, but, you know, we, from instantly, everybody got along so good, and they had such good people. Oh, last story I'm gonna tell you, Roseanne won one Emmy for that show, and uh, uh, the show was looked down on, you know, as, because of the, the way people looked, and it didn't get the respect it deserved. But um, my mother, if you've seen uh, uh, The Queen of Meth, the documentary series about my sister, and our family, uh, my mother, who, who did not raise me, who passed away, and then I, uh, we had a very acrimonious relationship. And, uh, but the day after she, she died, I flew in to where she was buried and, and read this letter saying, on one side, everything I'm mad about, on the other side, everything I'm grateful for. And it, it turned out that they were kind of the same things. I'm mad you left, but I'm grateful you left because my dad was a good man and you know and and you do that letter and then you leave it there and then you move on with your life that that's at least what what I did and uh and so we do we uh, John Randolph was going to die on the show Roseanne and Jackie's dad and uh and tried to figure out how to do the show and I and I gave her the letter that I'd read at my mom's grave and she read that letter she changed some of the words around but that was the letter she read at, his, at her dad's funeral because they had this and then she won an Emmy for that. I'm gonna. I'm trying to take. Uh, I'm trying to take credit for her Emmy. I'm not, but you know, she was. It was so good, you know. So, all right. Well, it is absolutely fantastic. Buddy, thank happening. you, everybody. I appreciate you all. Yeah, it's good Tom, to talk to you. Tom, everybody. you'll be headed back to your table. I will be headed back to my table. Hang out with this guy, please.
Tom Arnold, give it up. Thank you, guys. Thank Thank you. you. Hey, this is Alex Malari Jr. and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to hit that like button, share, and subscribe. Your emperor commands it. Thanks for watching.